When someone is important to you, you take the time to get to know them as best that you can so that you can properly relate to them. For example, if you start a new job, you want to learn how your boss operates. You want to know uh, what expectations does she have or what style of communication does he exhibit and so on so that you can be as successful as you can be in your job. The same is true of friendships. You want to get to know what your friends like and don't like. You want to find out what matters to them and, and, and how they like to spend their time so you can foster a better relationship. And this is certainly true when it comes to a marriage. You know, my wife Kelly and I have been married for 30 years, and it has been a process of getting to know each other better year after year. In order to grow in our relationship, we needed to get to know each other more so that we can serve one another and be blessed uh, by each other, by how God has created each one of us with our own unique gifts and talents that are meant to bless one another. You know, not long ago, Kelly told me that uh, after 30 years, she's finally getting used to me. <laughs> That's how she phrased it. 30 years, you know, I'm, I'm finally getting used to you. Now, if you know Kelly, uh, that's her sense of humor. And it's her way of saying that she appreciates how I think. Uh, she appreciates, you know, um, me for who I am. And, and if you know Kelly, you can guess that when she said it, she was probably laughing hysterically because she was. And she could barely get through it with her laughing because she thinks that's just a funny way of saying it. And that's one of her personality traits. But you know, wh what's clear is that whether it's at work or with friends or in a marriage, when someone is important to you, you get to know them as best you can so that you can properly relate to them. And what all of us need to realize is that this couldn't be more true as it relates to Jesus. Couldn't be more true as it relates to Christ. See, Jesus is the most important person to all of us. He really is. Uh, he is the most important person to all of humanity, whether people realize it or not. Who he is, what he taught, and what he accomplished impacts every person in the most profound ways. So it's imperative that we get to know him. And even though we will spend our entire lives getting to know Jesus, we decided over these last few weeks to take the time to purposely get to know Jesus more as we approached this special day. And what we've seen has been amazing. Leading up to today, we examined really five key traits about Jesus. To start, we saw how Jesus is God with us. And we learned how Jesus, the Son of God, took on full humanity and how because of that, we can have full confidence that he can relate to us. And we know that, you know, he understands us and he knows what we go through, as Antonio said, as humans. Next, we learned that Jesus was a friend of sinners. And we discovered why he would often spend time with people who didn't live the most upstanding lives. He did it to show the world that he came to save all of us because we're all sinners in need of grace. And he did it to teach all of us who are Christians that we are to reflect to others how God feels about them, that he is for them, and that uh, all those who are willing to turn to Jesus can be saved. And that we're to reflect this, reflect God's heart to them so that they want to do this. After this, we learn that Jesus is a compassionate physician, Right? We learn that he came to heal in the most profound of ways. He came to deliver us from our sins. Then we learn that Jesus is the greatest teacher ever. He's the greatest teacher that ever lived and, and how this teaches us that we can know without any doubt that we can fully trust him and know with certainty that he always knows what is best for us. And because he can be fully trusted and is committed to giving us what is best, we can live with true freedom. True freedom. And finally, last week, we learned that Jesus was and is a miracle worker. He is able to bring about whatever is necessary and needed in any situation. And not only is he able, but he is more than willing to help us. Now today, on this most special day of the entire year, we will investigate and celebrate the fact that Jesus is also our victorious sacrifice. But before we do, let's pray together. Lord, on this special day, this special day, Easter, Resurrection Sunday, Lord, as we come to just examine this next, this next character trait of your son, this next character trait of Jesus, that we would uh, learn all that we need and let it impact our lives. God, speak to each one of us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 
what does it mean that Jesus is our victorious sacrifice? Well, to understand this, let's break it down by looking at both words, starting with the last one first. You know, in 1 John chapter 2, we are told that Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not only for ours, but also for the sins of the world. And later in the same letter, it says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. We've seen it twice there. It says, Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. You see, all of us sin. We all sin. There is no person who has or ever will live who does not sin, except one. And that person was Jesus. Apart from him, all people sin. And sin, the Bible teaches us, separates us from God. And left undealt with, our sin will keep us separated from God forever. In other words, all people would go to hell unless something was done to pay the penalty that needed to be paid for all sin so that people could have the opportunity to go to heaven. The problem, though, was that only a sinless person could qualify to do this. And not only that, but only God himself has the power to overcome sin for all of humanity for all time. In short, the only person who could pay the penalty for all sin was someone who was fully God and fully human and sinless. And there is only one person that this applies to, and it's Jesus. We see this truth proclaimed in 1 Timothy, where it says this, this is good and pleases God, our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator. There's only one mediator between God and mankind, the man Jesus, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. There's only one mediator because there was only one person who could do what needed to be done. So Jesus did what only he could do. He willingly sacrificed himself to satisfy divine justice out of God's great divine love for us. And so on that Friday, Jesus allowed himself to die for us on the cross. He made it possible for our sins to be forgiven and for us to be granted eternal life when we put our faith and trust in Jesus and what he did for us. But you know, this great act of love would only have been a tragedy if something else didn't take place. You see, Jesus not only paid the penalty for all sin on the cross, but he defeated sin and death once and for all by overcoming the grave. As we learn from the book of 1 Corinthians, if Christ had not been raised, it says, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. You see, without the resurrection, the cross would have only been a tragedy. But because of the resurrection, it is a victory. It is the most important victory of all time. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus defeated the powers of evil, for example. As it says in Colossians 2, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. When we commit our lives to him, he says, he forgave us of all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken away, nailing it to the cross, as we've just seen. But then it goes on to say this as well. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. On that day, evil thought it had its greatest victory. Evil thought it had won the day, but it was ultimately defeated. And through his death and resurrection, Jesus defeated sin and death to give us victory. For God has told us the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, this victory is that we can be forgiven of our sin and we can receive eternal life. As the Gospel of John proclaims, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that through him, that whoever believes in him, they shall not perish, but have eternal life. 
For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And in the book of Romans, we're told, as scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And what makes this even all the more amazing is that when we ask to be forgiven, when we entrust our lives to Jesus, commit our lives to him, we are saved forever. For God has told us in the book of Ephesians, and you were also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, and it says in there, upon having believed that moment, that instant you believed, you're marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. See, when we call on Jesus to forgive us and to save us, it is done. And and our inheritance, our place in heaven, as the Bible says, is guaranteed. We can know this without a doubt. That's why it says in 1 John chapter 5, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. And this life in his, is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. And whoever does not have the son does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. You may know it. We can know that we have eternal life. We can know that we have the greatest victory when we commit our lives to Jesus. And that's because he is our victorious sacrifice. It's so amazing. So amazing. And this is why every year on this day, we celebrate. We celebrate. We celebrate the fact that when we place our faith in Jesus, when we ask him to rescue us from our sin, when we entrust our lives into his hands, he saves us and we can know and know without a doubt we have eternal life. In essence, on this day, we celebrate all that we have to look forward to. We let, all that we have to look forward to, that day when we see Jesus face to face, when we, have, when we enter into heaven and are there for all eternity. We see this expressed by Peter when God inspired him to write the following. Listen to these words. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth, into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials, These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls." See, on this day where we celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus, we rejoice in the future hope that we have as Christians. We have a place in heaven waiting for us that can never be forsaken or taken away. It can never be lost. It is ours forever. For as Jesus taught, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Because Jesus is our victorious sacrifice, when we place our faith in him, we have this place in heaven forever, this future hope. We don't ever have to fear death or wonder what awaits us on the other side. We know what awaits us. We know who will be there to greet us. And this is more than enough reason to celebrate. More than enough reason. 
It's the main reason why we celebrate. But here's the thing. That's not all what Jesus as our victorious sacrifice means to us. That's not all it means. You see, there's more to what Jesus' death and resurrection has done for us. You see, having a place in heaven for all eternity, I mean, that is the most important. It's the most important blessing of his death and resurrection. And it's more than enough. If we never receive anything from God, that is more than enough because it is for all eternity. Is the most significant development, the most important reason why we celebrate and what God has done for us. But the good news is that there is still more. And we discover this in the Gospel of John, where we read about an incident that happened where one of Jesus' close friends had died. You see, Jesus was close to a man named Lazarus, and Lazarus had uh, become very sick. Uh, His sisters, Mary and uh, Martha, sent word to Jesus about this, hoping that Jesus would get there in time in order to heal their brother. And yet, by the time Jesus got there, Lazarus had died. And picking up the account at verse 21 of chapter 11 in the Gospel of John, this is what we read. It says, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. See, in her grief, Martha expressed her deep disappointment that Jesus didn't get there in time before her brother had died. And she thought all was lost. But in saying this, she didn't want to be overly critical. So she tells Jesus that she still believes in his ability to heal. It's just that he didn't get there in time. In response, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answers, oh, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. In other words, Martha is saying that she believes in what we have to look forward to, you know, but that at the present moment, her brother is dead. So Jesus responds again. He said to her, I'm the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. See, Jesus tells her that he is the resurrection and the life. And Martha affirms her belief that Jesus is the Messiah. But what's equally important to notice here is that in this moment, Jesus' focus wasn't upon eternity. It wasn't upon what was to come. His focus was upon the here and now. His focus wasn't upon what we have to look forward to as Christians. It was in that moment, in the here and now, in the present. And what happens next is incredible. Let's read. It says, Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he's been there for four days. Then Jesus said, didn't I tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. You see, Jesus brought Lazarus back to physical life in the present. Why? Well, he did it so that people would know that he was sent from the Father. He told us that. He did it as proof that he is the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, yes. But he also did it because he loved Lazarus. And he wanted to bring healing in that moment. Or to put it another way, he did it because he wanted to display that his resurrection power is not only for what is to come. He is the resurrection and the life. And that power is available to us now. It's available to us now. You see, sometimes we need new life now. Sometimes we need to experience Jesus' resurrection power for this life in the here and now. And the good news is that it's available to us. As it says in the book of Ephesians, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, which we've learned about, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. 
That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. See, the power that gave Jesus victory over sin and death is available for us to see victories in the here and now. And, the, and this is such good news because all of us find ourselves in dead places in life. We all find ourselves in dead places at various times in our lives. There are times when we face maybe challenges in our careers and we may feel that we've reached a dead end. There are times in our relations where we can feel there is no hope for change and we may be feeling dead inside. There are many times in our struggles with sin and our own failures that where we may think a positive future is simply dead and gone. Whatever it may be, we can all reach dead places in our life. And, and Jesus wants us to know that he is the resurrection and the life. And he can bring about victory no matter what we may be facing or how hopeless it may seem. And so let me ask you, are you in a dead place right now? Do you feel like you're in a dead place right now or you know it? You know, a reality of life is that we still face battles. We live in a world that is often contrary to what is good for us. We live in a world that brings us pain. Uh, we have sin natures that we have to contend with where the bad we don't want to do, we end up doing. And the good we want to do, we don't do. We face spiritual forces of evil that seek our destruction. They want to derail us and destroy us if they can. In this life, we still face temptations and trials. But the good news is that the war has been won. The war has been won. And not only has the war been won, but we can experience victories in the battles that we have to face this side of heaven. Because Jesus said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Now, he says, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus is our victorious sacrifice, both for salvation and for all the battles that we have to face until he comes again. Or to put it another way, Jesus is our champion. He is our great and mighty champion. And to emphasize this, take a look. Sometimes winning doesn't look like winning. Sometimes a win looks an awful lot like loss, looks an awful lot like death. How many times have you been knocked down, tempted to doubt when things don't go the way we think they should? You could imagine the disciples' confusion. When Jesus, their king, their champion, he, he was nailed to a cross and died. He seemingly lost, and they didn't know what to do. What you and I often miss, and, and what the disciples didn't see was, was that this was all a part of the plan. Jesus said, no one takes my life, I lay it down. What looked like the greatest loss in history was in fact a, a paradigm shifting victory. Jesus rose from the grave and death couldn't touch him. Sin had lost its power and he was crowned the champion of all champions, undefeated. The same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in us, which means his victory over sin is your victory over sin. Your victory over addiction and shame. That thing that you thought was dead in your life, he stands ready to breathe new life. His win is now your win. And this victory reverberates through the centuries, declaring forevermore that he is our champion and he is alive. Jesus is alive. And the power that raised him from the dead and brought him back to life is available to us. And it's, it's what enables us to have a place in heaven that is secure for all eternity. And it's what enables us to experience victories in the here and now until we experience the ultimate victory when Jesus comes again. And so this morning, as we celebrate all of this, I want to encourage us in two ways. First, if you have never committed your life to Jesus, I want to encourage you to do so and do so right now. All it takes is for you to sincerely share with God the following. Just say to God, talk to him, prayer. It's just talking to God. Say to him, God, thank you for what you've done for me. I believe you sent Jesus to die for my sins instead of me. 
I believe Jesus rose again to give me eternal life. Please forgive me for the wrong things I've done. I invite you into my life. Teach me to do everything you want me to do and to follow you all the days of my life. I pray this believing in what Jesus did for me. See, it's not the exact words, but if you can express this to God, do so. From your heart, ask him to save you. If you can do this, don't wait. Pray this right now and receive the gift of eternal life that God longs to give to you. In fact, allow me to lead you in this prayer right now. If you're sitting and you're watching, God is listening and he wants you to pray this to him. He wants you to express this to him from your heart so that you can cross over from death to life. That's why he came. That's why he endured all he did on the cross. That's why he defeated death and sin and rose again for you. For you to save you for all eternity where you never have to doubt where you're going when you die. You can be in heaven. If you've never made this commitment or you are unsure if you have, just pray this to God right now. Say, God, thank you for what you've done for me. I believe you sent Jesus to die for my sins instead of me. I believe Jesus rose again to give me eternal life. Please forgive me for the wrong things I've done. I invite you into my life. Teach me to do everything you want me to do and to follow you all the days of my life. I pray this believing what Jesus did for me. If you prayed that prayer, the Bible tells the angels are rejoicing in heaven. You have crossed over from death to life and you can know that you are saved. He is your victorious sacrifice. He has brought you the ultimate victory and you can have peace forever because of that alone. Now, for those of us who have already committed our lives to Jesus, the second thing I want to encourage us to do is to continue to look to God to save us. Not ultimately, because once we commit our lives to him, we know we have that place in heaven, our inheritance, it's guaranteed. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm saying that we need God to continue to save us. We need him to continue to rescue us. And especially so if you're in a dead place right now. Ask God to bring his resurrection power into your situation. Trust him to save you. Walk towards him. Leave your grave clothes behind and live in the freedom that he desires for you. He wants to do that. It's never too late. You can say, well, I, I committed my life to him, but I've, I've messed up. He's there for you. I've fallen down. He says, get back up. Peter, when he wondered, how many times should we forgive someone? Seven times. Jesus says 70 times seven. He means every single time. If we confess our sins, God tells us he is, he is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. When we humble ourselves before him, he will lift us up. When we're going through a difficult time and we don't know how to get through it, ask God to bring his resurrection power to help see you through. Ask him to give you the strength to, to, to persevere, to get through the trial that you're facing, to know that there's always hope when you have your hope in Jesus. Whether it's you know, trials or temptations, whatever it is you face, you can have victory each and every day and never give up. We have hope eternal, a place in heaven that is secure, but we can have the hope that we can live in victory in the battles we face in this life. And God wants that for you. So ask him to save you for all eternity and to continue to rescue us until that day we see him face to face. He wants us to live in that freedom. You know, as one pastor has said about Jesus' death and resurrection, he says this. About the resurrection, he says, it is not just the most important miracle ever. It is not just the most astounding event in the life of the Messiah. It is not just an essential item in your theological outline. It is not just the reason for the most important celebratory season of the church. It is not just your hope for the future. No, the resurrection is, that, is all that and more. It is also meant to be the window through which you view all of life. That is so true. It is meant to be the window through which we view all of life. Jesus died and rose again for us. That should help us view everything that we have to face, every opportunity that we have, everything that we do until we see him. It should be through that lens. Knowing how much, you want to know how much God loves you? He died on the cross and rose again for you. Do you want to know if he's for you? He died on the cross and rose for you. 
Do you think he has the ability to help you in whatever situation that you face? He died on the cross. He endured it all and defeated death and rose from the grave. It is the lens through which we should see all of life. And so let's allow this day not only to be a celebration, but let's allow the resurrection to bring the liberation that we need each and every day in our lives. May God bless us on this incredible day. On this incredible day called Easter, on this incredible day, Resurrection Sunday. For he has risen. He has risen indeed. And he wants to live in light of that great and glorious truth and the reality of what that means for our lives when we place our faith and trust in him. Thank you and may God bless you. And let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you love us so much that you died on the cross for us, paying the penalty for all sin. And you rose again, defeating sin and death and the powers of evil once and for all. And Lord, we know that the ultimate Victory has been won. We know that the war has been won. And when we place our faith and trust in you, we have a place in heaven that is secure and can never be taken away. But we also know we face battles in this life. And Lord, we thank you for the good news that we can see victories because you died and rose again. Help us to see our lives through this lens. Help us to see our lives through this, this, this incredible victorious sacrifice that you made for us so that we may live fully for you. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.